This is Outbreak News This Week, brought to you by the Global Dispatch Incorporated. Outbreak News This Week is your source for all the news about worms and germs. And now, your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com. Here's Robert Harriman. Well, good evening, Tampa Bay and everybody that's listening online, streaming. Welcome to the show. My name is Robert, and I appreciate you listening. Well, about a week or so ago, I saw this article about a professor and her parasitology students that traveled to Guatemala. They went there to perform a variety of jobs to uh, help the people there to prevent the parasitic infection, Chagas disease. Joining me now is Patricia Dorn, Ph.D., Dr. Dorn is a Hutchinson Distinguished Professor of Biological Sciences at Loyola University, New Orleans. Dr. Dorn, welcome to the show, ma'am. Thank you very much, Robert. I'm happy to be here. Yes, ma'am. I'm very happy to have you here. And I I saw the news release from Loyola, and um, it caught my attention, and your class trip was very interesting and actually made me a little jealous because I didn't have any opportunity like that when I was an undergrad. (laughs) Yeah, at Loyola, we believe by learning by doing. Yeah, it's so fantastic it's stuff. The, field is the way to learn. Yeah, but before we get into that, I, I want to give my audience a good overview of Chagas disease so they have a good understanding um, of what this parasitic disease is all about. So, Dr. Dorn, what is Chagas disease? So, Chagas is named for Carlos Chagas, a Brazilian more than 100 years ago. He described the parasite. As you mentioned, it's a parasitic disease. He also described these kissing bugs that transmit the disease, so they carry the parasite. And he also described reservoir species, so many animals that carry the parasite. So it's actually a leading cause of heart disease in in Latin America. And you mentioned Latin America. Are there other parts of the world where Chagas is, is found, and how prevalent is it in Latin America? It's actually the most serious parasitic disease in Latin America. More than 6 million people are carrying the parasite. It's endemic to Latin America, but of course, we're a global world now, and we all move around quite a lot. So there's a very rough estimate of maybe 300,000 people in the U.S. carry the parasite, and maybe it's 100,000 in Europe, Japan, Australia, etc. Now, you mentioned a vector called the kissing bug, and... uh this is how people and animals um, would get infected with uh, with the parasite. And the parasite's name is Trypanosoma cruzi. Exactly. So it's a, it's a little protozoan, a microscopic single-celled trypanosome. And, yeah, it's carried by what we call kissing bugs. Isn't that a nice name? Yeah. So, so, sounds very, uh, very <laughs> <That's>, nice. <laughs> yeah. So most people, in fact, about 80% of the people will get the parasite through this kissing bug and... They're stealth feeders. They actually hide during the day in the cracks and crevices, usually in like adobe huts, substandard house. And they come out at night and they feed. We call them kissing bugs because what's uncovered at night is your face, right? Mm -hmm. So they could feed on your face, but they actually can feed anywhere on the body. And we also call them very bad-mannered bugs because unlike a malarial uh, um, malaria parasite, which is injected into you by a mosquito, these kissing bugs actually poop while they're feeding. Nice. (laughs) So they're taking so much blood that they have to excrete some liquid to keep feeding on so much blood. So they, they sneak out at night, you're asleep, they crawl down the wall in the adobe hut, crawl onto your skin, and take the blood meal and poop at the same time. Parasites in the poop, and of course you're asleep, so you scratch it, and the parasite gets into the bite wound or your eyes or nose or mouth and gets into your bloodstream and then goes off to its, its target tissue. Now, that's not the only way we can contract it, though, right? I mean, I've read reports of um, people in Venezuela or Brazil um, getting it from the berries uh, that may, they may have eaten. Exactly. So the most common way is through the this, this kissing bug insect vector. But... Very sadly, mothers can pass it to their babies, congenital infection, about between 1% and 12% of the time an infected mom will pass it to her baby. Um, the, the food or drink contamination. So you remember these bugs like to hide in cracks, and if they're in that sugar cane or 
with the juice and you press the sugar cane to make fresh sugar cane juice or the berries and there's bug poop in there with live parasites and you drink it, you absolutely, and there's been these micro epidemics in Brazil, Venezuela, and other places. Also, um, blood and organ transplant, transplantation. And just in 2007, the U.S. started screening the blood supply because there were uh, a couple dozen, not sorry, not a couple dozen, less than a dozen cases of blood and organ transplant um, transmission of Chagas. And also, we always have to be careful because laboratory accidents actually are, are a concern if you stick yourself with a needle with the parasite. So the main ones, kissing bugs, but also congenital or mother to baby and contaminated food and drink and blood and solid organ transplants. Now, how about the signs and symptoms? I mean, is there an acute, acute disease and a chronic disease? And how, how does this work and what organs are really affected? Right. So... When we're first infected, we may have a bad headache, even for a couple weeks. We may have a swollen eye, one swollen eye called Romagna's sign, if that's where the parasite feces went in, or uh, what's called a shigoma, which is a lump on the, on the skin where the, where the parasite entered. But for most people, and if you think most people that are at risk in Latin America in very rural, poor areas, they have sort of flu-like symptoms not infrequently from all kinds of infections. And so most people have no idea they've become infected. And this acute phase lasts, you know, the few, few weeks to a couple months, and then the parasite goes into the tissues. So it especially likes heart muscle. That's the main organ that's affected. And then there's absolutely no symptoms. And the person may live 10, 20, 30 years and die suddenly of heart disease and never know that they were infected. So yeah. the main symptoms for the acute phase are that one swollen eye, maybe a headache, mm -hmm. fever, but very nondescript. But the chronic symptoms are heart disease. And then also in South America, we see a mega syndrome where the nerves are damaged and actually your body overgrows the organs like your esophagus or your intestines. So your intestines can be as big around as your upper thigh. Right. And you can imagine the horrible digestive problems these people have. But that's less frequent than heart disease. Heart disease is the main symptom. Sure. Now, now how, how is Chagas uh, treated? So not very well, unfortunately. Uh, presently, we have two drugs available. And... They need to be taken for one to three months, and they have very nasty side effects. And so some people just can't even tolerate the drugs. There are some new ones um, in the pipeline. The Drugs for Neglected Tropical Diseases, the NDI, is working very hard on um, trying to get some new drugs available. In the U.S., FDA has no approved drugs for Chagas. So you need to go to the CDC, and there are these two drugs available through an investigational protocol. And so, uh, since the treatment options are not that great, preventive measures are probably key. Absolutely. So, keeping humans away from those kissing bugs is, is really preeminent in terms of avoiding transmission and preventing this disease in the first place. And that's really been the focus of our research. Right. Now, you, you, you mentioned a, a rather large number um, concerning chagas here in the U.S., I've had other parasitologists on the show tell me the same thing. And I've actually had somebody from the San Antonio Humane Society several years ago uh, discussing, you know, a, a rash of dogs they were seeing with chagas. Um, is, are, are we seeing this big number of chagas uh, from migration of people or, or is a lot of the stuff localized? Right. So a very rough estimate because, of course, it depends on knowing how many people are coming from endemic countries, as well as how many of those are coming infected. And so a very rough number is 300,000 immigrants from Latin American countries are in the U.S., and we really need to be concerned about identifying and screening, especially pregnant women, so that they're not passing it on to their babies. But, in fact, locally acquiring the parasite is very rare in the U.S. It's less than a couple dozen cases of locally acquired Chagas disease have been documented in the U.S. And remember now, this is after screening tens of millions of units of blood. So it's probably still not very frequent 
that people are contracting the disease from the kissing bugs in the U.S. Although the kissing bugs are here, and we've shown in our lab and others as well, the bugs are infected. But you're right about the dogs. And we did some studies here in Louisiana. In fact, I've worked with Homeland Security. They have a large kennel in Texas, and many of the dogs were dying of Chagas. And we think the dogs and other animals eat the bugs, and they get infected with the parasite that way. And it is a very serious veterinary problem, and none of the drugs are available currently to treat the dogs. All right. Well, let's uh, switch gears to the trip to Guatemala. Um, Can you tell my audience, what was the purpose of this and what activities uh, did the students get involved in? So I've been working um, in research of just this fabulous collaboration for the last 21 years with investigators in Guatemala, um, looking at how we can prevent transmission. And my collaborator there has developed this eco-health approach So it's community-based where the villagers are involved and make home improvements that make their houses refractory or make the bugs not live in the houses with them. It's environmentally friendly. We worked for a couple years with architects and engineers developing local materials for very low cost, so $50 a house, and the villagers do the work. And, you know, again, we can't afford cement, but there's lots of volcanic ash, and we've develop local materials to plaster the walls and to, quote, unquote, I'm air quoting the cement because it's it's a cement made with volcanic ash and sand, et cetera. And this has made it possible to interrupt transmission of Chagas in Central America. Well, normally this is something the villages would do for themselves, and we teach them, but of course there's elderly people or disabled people or people that can't make their own home improvements. So my students are learning about parasitology, and I thought, what better way to take them to the field, see what conditions put people at risk for contracting Chagas and other parasitic diseases. And what we did is improve the house of an elderly widow, a 75-year-old woman named Doña Maura, and the students went and they learned the eco-health method side-by-side with the villagers and improved Doña Maura's house so she doesn't have to worry anymore about Chagas. We've also seen that there's less malaria, and also you don't get the worm infections that come from having the dirt floor. Mm -hmm. So I think it was a pretty powerful way to learn parasitology and interact with the community. And, of course, as a Jesuit school, Loyola University, New Orleans, is all about um, being women and men for others and service learning. So this was our service learning project. Fantastic. Now, was part of that... um getting rid of the thatch hutches, the thatch roofs and all that? So in this village where we're working, they pretty much have already, they've changed over to those metallic roofs. Uh-huh. And interestingly, the main species that's there presently lives in the adobe walls. The, the one that was introduced, Rodneus is the species, mm-hmm. that lived in the thatch roof, we've mostly eradicated by spraying. But spraying doesn't work for this species because it lives in the forest as well. So you spray and you come back three months later and it's back in the house. So that's why we have to make these long-term improvements with plastering the walls and cementing the floors and then the bugs stay in the forest and don't come back into the home. How many students joined you? So six students were able to come with me and I was really proud of uh, Loyola supported them in paying nearly all of their, their airfare. And then the four students who couldn't come did complementary projects. So they actually worked with Loyola design students and made educational materials that we we then brought and handed out in the village. Oh, that's great. So, I mean, the people of the particular village you're at, were most of them familiar with Chagas or not? Right. So we've been working there, as I mentioned, for some time and working on the eco-health method. And we've shown through several scientific studies that it very effectively interrupts transmission. So we've been able to get the interest of other partners, including World Vision, and also a group of um, elementary school kids from New York that contacted me, Kids for World Health. And with the support of these other partners as well, we've been able to improve over 7,000 homes in, in Central America, and now we're expanding to extend this across Central America and hoping to interrupt transmission of Chagas across Central America with this eco-health approach. 
Now, so how serious is the problem in Central America as, as opposed to South America? It's extremely serious, especially yeah. Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. We're still seeing acute cases. So what we do is test the blood of school children to find out who is still, are people still getting infected, infected or is the, the people that show positive for T. cruzi, the parasite from when Rodneyus was there, that was a very efficient factor, or because they, they contracted the disease earlier. And we're seeing in those three countries that there still is active transmission. So it's a very serious. And again, it's throughout Latin America, it's more serious than all the other parasitic diseases together, including malaria, onchocerciasis, leishmaniasis, all of them together. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you, you collaborate with other researchers around the country and in Guatemala. Um, in, uh, I believe the website, if, correct me if I'm wrong, it's chagaseco.health.com. Right, chagaseco.health.com is the, the collaboration mostly with Central America and some in Mexico, yes. Yeah, so what kind of um, projects are you guys working on? So we have a, a five-year NSF grant to actually do a mathematical model to model transmission risk, so to take in all the factors and really be able to focus on how to best interrupt transmission. And it's pretty exciting because we're using the new genomics and bioinformatics tools, and we collect the kissing bugs from the houses or the chicken coops or um, even in the forest, and you can just take the DNA from the bug abdomen, and you've geolocated that bug so you know exactly where that bug came from. You know how many people live in that house, the quality of that the walls and the roof in that house, how many dogs are there, what the people do for a living. And then you can look from the DNA from the abdomen of the bug, the genetics of the bug, the genetics of the parasite, because there's actually six different strains of the parasite. Interestingly, we can also tell what the bug's been feeding on, and now we have this very rich data set that's all the biology and also all the sociology, and, and we're working with engineers that are doing some mathematical modeling to be able to put all that data together and really focus our efforts on how best to interrupt transmission. Fascinating. Very fascinating. Um, So that's one thing. Can I talk a minute about what we're doing in the U.S.? Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) So I work with, um, so Carlota Monroy is my main collaborator in Guatemala. She's the first woman ever to win the National Science Award in Guatemala. And in the U.S., I work with uh, Dr. Steve Klotz, who until recently was Chief of Infectious Diseases in the Med School in Tucson, and Dr. Um, Justin Schmidt, who's quite famous, in fact was interviewed 243 times last year for his Sting of the Wild book. He let all these critters sting and bite him, and he he talks about, you might want to talk with him about (laughs) how it it felt. So we've um, been looking in Bisbee, Arizona, and especially Zacatecas Canyon, because the, one of the reasons that people in the state don't get shagas so frequently because, you know, we, because of the kissing bugs is that we live in houses that are, that are you know, with air conditioning, and so the, but we don't live with the bugs. But in Bisbee, we're finding that the bugs live in the houses and complete their life cycles in the houses. So I think we're going to go this summer and test the population and see if they're getting infected and also do some environmental surveys of, you know, what puts people at risk of having the bugs in their houses. So it looks like although bugs don't normally colonize, the kissing bugs don't normally colonize houses in the U.S., in Bisbee they are. So we're we're following up on that. So that's another interesting project we have going. We're also working here in New Orleans, my lab, along with some folks at Tulane, identified the first transmission, local transmission in Louisiana, here in New Orleans. And we've done some studies about what the bugs are feeding on here, and it's been pretty interesting. Their main blood source for the bugs is frogs. No kidding. <laughs> which is kind of a surprise. Yeah. There's lots of frogs here. The second most common blood source for the bugs here is humans. So it kind of overturned the dogma that humans and bugs don't interact in the state. So we've seen that also in Arizona where we've looked at blood sources. In fact, a lot of the bugs are feeding on humans. They're just not 
very efficient at transmitting the parasite. We kind of say that they're better mannered, so they seem to take their blood meal and then leave the host and go poop later. Maybe that explains why they don't transmit as well. Right. Well, really interesting stuff, and I encourage the audience, if you want to learn more, check out www.shagasecohealth.com. Thank you, Dr. Patricia Dorn, for your time and expertise, and ma'am, keep up the good work. Thanks. Thank you very much for the opportunity. You bet. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Let's um, 